Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Well, good morning and welcome to Downtown Baptist Church, Orlando. We're excited that you're watching us through all the different means that you can. And today is Easter. It's the day Jesus rose from the grave, and it's the reason why we are here at Downtown Baptist and so thankful that you're tuning in again. Uh, some announcements to go over with you this morning. Uh, our Annie Armstrong Easter offering, our goal is 6,000. We haven't been making a lot of mention about this just with everything going on. But you as church members, if we know that missions is key to you, 
it's important to me. It's important to our church and our state and our state convention and national convention. So our goal is 6,000. So we're just going to continue to take up Annie Armstrong until we meet our goal. Uh, we're not going to shut it off just because it is Easter. So if you could just give faithfully to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Some other announcements, again, is how to view us, how to watch us. And so you can go to our church website at dbo.church. There you'll see several links. It has the information for the conference call. And you can call in by going to 425-436-6309. The PIN number is 749-474-POUND, reference number one. And if you do call in to the conference call, be sure to mute your phone as to not to have any type of feedback. You can also catch us on Facebook and also YouTube. But we really encourage you to watch us through uh, our church website. There's many ways that you can give. You can go to our church website and give online directly, or you can go to the online community app, or you can do it the old-fashioned way by mailing it in. And you can mail it in to 120 East Pine Street, Orlando, Florida, 32801. Again, we are thankful that you are worshiping with us this Sunday morning. And also, don't forget that we have another way that you can worship, which is uh, every weeknight, or not every weeknight, every Wednesday night uh, at 7 o'clock, we're having our praise and prayer chat. And we want you to tune into that. That's through Facebook and Facebook only. And uh, so that way we can at least as a church get together, communicate, lift up praise requests, uh, prayer requests, and also just mention passages of Scripture. I will be the one facilitating that, and you have been really faithful uh, in uh, uh, tuning in to the praise and prayer chat every Wednesday at 7. So uh, please tune into that. Also, the Right Now Media, if you haven't signed, signed up for your free account, we encourage you to do so. You can go to our church website, follow the link to Right Now Media. And then we as a church, we, I'm encouraging everyone to do the study on the powerful names of Jesus. And so that is by Dr. Tony Evans. So, so go there, watch the videos. And I really do think that you will be blessed, especially in the days in which we're living, that we should not be living in fear or in a place of weakness, but living in a place of power and strength because we serve a great God in his name is Jesus Christ. Church family, thank you for worshiping with us this Sunday morning, and it is Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. time 
and praise.
his body the bread, his blood the wine, broken and poured out for love. The whole earth trembled, the veil was torn, love so thank you, Jesus, for what you endured on the cross and for the life that we have everlasting. For because you live, we too shall live. What great love you have for us. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? And it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. I am forgiven because you were forsaken. I am accepted. You were condemned. I am alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my king, would die for me? It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my king, would die for me? Amazing love. And it's 
my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you in all I do. I honor you. Again, and good morning for our Easter service. We're glad you're attending us on Facebook, YouTube, church website. So this morning for our Easter sermon, we're going to be out of Luke chapter 24. So if you have your copy of God's Word laying in your lap or near you, open it up to Luke chapter 24. And I'm going to read the first 12 verses uh, this morning. Listen to what the Apostle Luke writes, or Dr. Luke writes. He says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shiny garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. They remembered his words. And then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the mother uh, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to be like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clo uh, clothes lying by themselves. And he departed, marveling at himself at what had happened. Father, we thank you today for these words, how they give us hope, how they give us promise. And Lord, we thank you that every time that we go to your word, it comforts us when we need comfort. It gives us strength when we need, when we need strength, but it gives us hope where there seems to be despair and discouragement. And so, Father, I pray on this Easter day, as we are dealing with the COVID-19 crisis, that we would not worry about the crisis, but that we would be more focused on Christ in the crisis, knowing that our future lies ahead and that we have a hope and a promise of tomorrow. Lord, I pray that your words today would just live in us anew and afresh like they never have before, and that we would leave wherever we are, and as we have to travel out into the world, that we would be your shining light to those around us. Lord, we thank you for the resurrection. It is because of that that we're saved and that we're your children. And we ask and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As you consider the passage this morning, the title of the message is The Truth from the empty tomb. The truth from the empty tomb. And there are three promises, three truths that the empty tomb gives us this morning. The first truth is this. The sepulcher, sepulcher is vacant. Uh, that There's no one in it. The tomb is empty. The sepulcher is vacant. Go back to verses 1 through 12. It says, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and they went in and, and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> we are reminded here that the tomb is empty. It, it's vacant. There's been nobody in this tomb forever how long. When they went in, uh, they found no body. They found no person. They found no imitator. They found no clone or, or wax figure. It was empty except for the burial cloths of Christ. And so we are very thankful that there is no one in the tomb now. Uh, notice this, though, that the, there were some other things happening in the tomb. The, the angels appeared. Uh, the, they were per perplexed by what had happened. For some odd reason, they had forgotten the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had forgotten the promises that he, he had already mentioned to them. The angels show up, and it gives us a, a great picture of what this heavenly host looked like. 
In verse 4, and now it happened as they were greatly perplexed, meaning they, they, they couldn't understand what was going on. They couldn't figure out how the stone had been rolled away. They couldn't figure out where the Roman guards were. Uh, they couldn't figure out why the body of the Lord wasn't there, that the clothes, the cloths were lying there on the cold slab. But here these two angels showed up. The two men stood by them in shining garments. It was almost as if they had walked into the tomb, seen it, and the angels of the Lord appeared miraculously, as I believe they did. Uh, the women, knowing that these probably were angels, they bowed their face to the ground. And the angels asked them a question, Why are you afraid and, and why do you seek the living among the dead? They had to be reminded that Jesus is not dead, he's living. And we as the people of God, we need to be reminded of that promise now. Yes, I know that we, as we come to church, we celebrate the risen resurrection of the Savior. But we have to remember that, especially in the days in which we live. Now more than ever, uh, we need to be people of promise and hope. And I know that in the COVID crisis, it, it seems to be that there's not a lot of hope and promise. You, you listen to the news. One day the stock market is up. The next day it's down. Uh, you listen to the words of our president, to the people on the corona task force. Uh, the, the death rate goes up. It drops down. It spikes higher the next day. More people are infected. Folks, listen. The promise of all this isn't that we're going to be past the COVID-19 crisis in hopefully the next couple weeks. Uh, the, the promise is, is that, we're not, that it's not going to be that we're going to be back at our jobs in the next several weeks. Uh, the promise of all of this is, is that we have a Savior. His name's Jesus Christ. He lives and reigns on heaven's throne. And really, there's nothing that we should be worried about. And so that is the hope that we have of this promise. And so we need to remind ourselves of that each and every day. Jesus gave us his words. A matter of fact, Jesus is the word. Uh, John 1, 1 tells us that in the beginning uh, was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Uh, the disciples here on this Easter morning, they had forgotten the words, and the angels have to tell these women about the words Jesus had already spoken to them, and they knew, but for some odd reason, they had forgotten. The angels recounted the Lord, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and, and on the third day, rise again. They had forgotten that. And we should never forget of the hope that Jesus has given to us. Not just the hope of the resurrection, but the hope that he is always with us. Jesus, when he ascended into heaven, he told the disciples that the Holy Spirit would come, who is his spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And no matter what we go through or where we go, God is always with us. Uh, going back to the Old Testament, Isaiah 55, 11 tells us of the power of God's word. So my word shall uh, be that goes forth from my mouth, and it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Well, we know that God's word went forth, and the word came out of the tomb, but more than just on Easter morning, we can stand on the promises of God knowing that the promises that he gave so many hundreds of years ago are still applicable to us today. Uh, they had an encounter with the Word, with the living Savior, and we need to do the same. Not only that, but, but listen, church family, worst case scenario, if we get sick and we die from whatever disease or illness, we're going to see Jesus face to face. Why? Because he is risen. The sepulcher is vacant. It's empty. That is our greatest hope that we have on this Easter and every Sunday, but not only just on every Sunday, but on every day of the week. That is our greatest hope and promise that we have. And remember, look what it says in verse 8. And they remembered his words. And we need to remember those words today. He is risen. He is risen indeed. The tomb is empty. We need to remember that. And that our joy, our joy and hope doesn't come from the White House. It doesn't come uh, from the schoolhouse. And it doesn't come from Capitol Hill but it comes from the hill of Mount Calvary. The sepulcher is empty. But number two this morning, I want you to realize is this, is that Satan is vanquished. The devil is defeated. 
Satan is vanquished. The enemy has been emptied of all his power. And we are very thankful of that. You see this in verses 36 through 42. Even though Satan is not mentioned in just those uh, eight verses, uh, we really do see that the enemy has been emptied of his power. Satan is vanquished and the devil is defeated. Listen to what Dr. Luke writes. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you. So this is already after the resurrection, already after the the women had come back, Peter had gone to the tomb, and we know from John's account that John uh, went to the tomb with Peter. Matter of fact, it was John who appeared, uh, who, who peeked into the tomb, and he was of the disciples, the first to believe. So now it's later on, on Resurrection Day, uh, sometime probably in the afternoon, and they're in the upper room, they're sealed in, the windows are shut, the doors are bolted and barred, and no one is getting in nor out, and then all of a sudden Jesus appeared in the room, and he says, peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. Verse 38, and then he said to them, why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your mind? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And when he had said this, they showed them, or he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy, and excuse me, but while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, "Have you any food here?" And so they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Here we see, even though Satan is not mentioned, we see that he has been vanquished, and here's where we see it. But before we get to that, church family, know this. Do not have a spirit of fear during these days. Do not have a spirit of fear in these days. We should have a spirit of hope and of joy and of comfort and of courage and of strength. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. That word fear there is not the word for phobia, but it is the word for uh, retreat, for defeat, to recoil back from. He has not given us that type of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Uh, John would later tell us in his epistles in 1 John 4, 4, For you are of God little children and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So Satan has been vanquished, but here we see it on Easter morning. How do we see it on Easter morning? I I believe we see it in verse 39. It says, Behold my hands and my feet. One of the things that God early that said early on in the Bible, especially at the creation account, is in the Garden of Eden, after man had already sinned and ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and that they should not have done, and God begins to bring out the curses. He, he curses uh, Adam and Eve, and he curses the serpent, Satan. But in the curse that he gives to humanity, he gives a promise. And it's in Genesis 3.15. And God himself says this, but I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now he's saying this to the serpent. And between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall crush his heel. Now you remember when Jesus was on the cross that they put nails into his, really his wrist and put nails into his ankles. And he says, Touch my hands and touch my feet. Yeah, Satan may have put some nails in the feet of Jesus, but those feet still had power and he crushed the head of the serpent. He vanquished him. Can you imagine what hell was like on that Good Friday? There, the God of the universe was splayed on a cross, hands stretched out, His body had stopped breathing. His head is hung low. The blood, all of his blood had stopped pouring. The Son of God was dead. And I guarantee you from about 3 p.m. until the resurrection happened, Satan and his minions were partying in hell. They thought, we have won. 
And they were counting the days, day one, Friday, we, we've got him, God is destroyed. Day two, Saturday, we've got him, he's destroyed, he's not coming back out. And then Sunday happens, day three, and they're still part, partying. And they're like, well, you know what, if, if God was going to do it, he would have already done it. And they are partying like they never have before. And Satan probably in his heart of hearts knew, thought, you know what, I didn't just, I didn't just bruise his heel. I crushed him. Well, that's not what happened. And the story didn't end just on a early Sunday morning. But that's where the story really started. And so he reminds the disciples to touch his hands, to behold my hands, behold my feet. He goes, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And we need to remember the same today. It is resurrection day. It is Easter. And we need to remember that the hands that have holes in them now are the same hands that will hold us in them in times of tragedy and despair. And he is holding us in his hands. Coronavirus is a very deadly and serious disease and illness. But I know that without a shadow of a doubt, my God is stronger than a virus and a disease. And we need to take hold of that. He was also showing them his hands and feet because he wanted them to see their salvation before them. That he was the one that took their iniquities. That he was the one that took their burdens. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Jesus also wanted to display to them the greatest love story of all, that there in their presence was the love of God standing and living and breathing before them. Romans 5, 8, Paul says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But not only in that, not only did he want them to be reminded of how he, he took their, uh, their burdens and how he was the, the greatest example of love, but he wanted to remind, remind them that if they would believe in him, that they would be the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. What Jesus did on the cross, no one else did. Jesus took your sin and he took my sin and made it his sin. Jesus took that into the tomb with him. But when Jesus came out, he buried our sin in the tomb. And he came forth giving us his righteousness that God the Father had displayed upon him. And from his account to our account, we all have the righteousness of God. Satan is vanquished. Paul would earlier say in the first letter to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 55 and following, uh, Paul taunts death. I, I love this passage. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Basically, in just those two phrases or sentences or questions, Paul is taunting the devil himself. See, in the Garden of Eden, Satan robbed from us, but not only that, but we gave him power and authority over us. But when Jesus rose from the grave, Satan was vanquished, and Jesus took back from Satan what we gave to him, our life. So he says, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ this morning. So we have seen that the sepulcher is vacant. We, we have seen that Satan is vanquished. But lastly, in number three this morning, the third promise in truth is that the Son is victorious. That the Son is victorious. Look in verses 44 through 53. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all these things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And then he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And then he said to them, 
Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are my witnesses of these things. Behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endowed with the power from on high. He reminds them of his words that he had spoken to them when he was in Galilee, but he reminds them of the words of all Scripture, that all these things had to be fulfilled. N not just that our sins were laid on him and he was beaten uh, for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of all of our sin was laid upon him. It was more than just that. It was more than him hanging on a cross, suspended between heaven and earth, and taking my sin and your sin on him. It was more than any of that. It was all of that plus being risen from the grave. So the son is victorious. He's victorious not just in his own resurrection, but he is victorious in and through us. And we have to remember that. We have to remember how we are victorious. Go back to verse 46 of Luke 24. Thus it is written, and it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the, the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And now verse 48. And you are my witnesses of these things. We have to remember that in these dark days, that we are the light of hope and the light of promise. And even though some of you I know are dealing with probably a financial issue, I want to tell you this, do not worry about the bank account because your father in heaven owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he owns the hills and everything underneath the hills. He will supply your needs. I've been there when I've had a financial crisis not knowing where the next paycheck was going to come from or not knowing how I was going to pay the next bill, but God came through. Now we're dealing with COVID-19. Now we're dealing with medical issues. Now we're dealing with financial issues. Some of you, maybe some of your family members have gotten this dreaded disease. But I want you to hold on to the promise that the son is victorious and that he is going to get us through these things. And as he's getting us through these things, we need to be the light of the world. We are his witnesses in these days. It's as if you have the light on your cell phone turned on, shining the light in the darkness. And that's what we need to do. Now more than ever, people need to hear a message of hope and promise. More than just like they're a sinner and they're going to die and go to hell without God. They need to hear something bigger and better than that. They need to hear, yes, they are a sinner and they need to repent. But there is a God in heaven who loves them. His name is Jesus Christ. Christ. He rose on Easter morning to give them eternal life if they would believe in him. And that's what we are called to do. That's the reason Jesus rose is that he gave us life and that we would be his witnesses and that we would tell people how good God is. Listen, I really do believe that God allows us to go through certain things. One is to draw us closer to him. And hopefully during these days, you are drawing close to God spending time with him now more than ever, like you never have before. You're going to the Right Now Media site, watching those studies by Dr. Evans on, about the powerful names of Jesus. But more than that, as you're walking in your neighborhood, and you're probably taking 10 to 15 walks a day, just like I am and other people, that you're using the opportunity that God has given you to witness to your neighbors and your friends like you never have before. People need hope in these days. Listen, discouragement's on the news, discouragement's coming from Washington, but listen, encouragement comes from the believer in Jesus Christ because we are his witnesses, we are his light in the world that is around us. The gospel does many things. The gospel saves and the gospel changes people. The gospel frees people, it redeems people, it rescues people. The go gospel conquers our enemy and the gospel liber liberates us and, he, and the gospel justifies us. The gospel unchains us. The gospel defeats our enemies and our foes. The gospel cleanses us, but one day the gospel is going to glorify us with the Son in heaven. 
So we need to be there and be that shining light and that witness that we can for people around us. So I want to ask you a question this morning. And the question that I want to ask you this morning is this. Do you know Jesus? And it's more than just having a head knowledge. Because many people today, they know of Jesus. They know that he was a great teacher and they know that he was a healer. Uh, they, they know that Jesus did many things. They know that Jesus was a great apologist and that he could defend scripture like no one else could. But when I ask you, do you know Jesus? Do you know him in your heart? Do you believe? See, Jesus came... And the reason the tomb is empty and Satan is vanquished and he's victorious wasn't, some, wasn't just because some room in a hewned out piece of mountain and stone was left empty. It was more than that. Because Jesus desires to have a relationship with you. And so do you know him as your Lord and as your Savior? And what better way to start the day, the week, but really the rest of your life than choosing Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. That's the reason we have Easter. That's the reason he came and died and he rose again. The way that you choose Jesus to be your Lord and Savior is you have to admit that you're a sinner. You have to admit that you have sinned against God. Sin means to miss the mark, and God's mark is holiness. None of us are holy, none of us are good. But Jesus was good. Remember I quoted to you earlier about the verse where it is in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It says, and he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. See, God took our sin and placed it on his son, Jesus Christ. And then in turn, the holiness of God is placed on us. So that means now in Jesus Christ, if you will believe in him through faith, you'll meet the mark. Uh, you'll, you'll meet God's standard. So you, you need to confess that you're a sinner and repent of your sins and, and then believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. One of the greatest verses of Scripture in, in order to help you believe in Jesus is John three sixteen, For God so loved the world, and I, I really believe you could take the word world out and put your name in there. And so I'm going to do it for me. I, I'm a believer in Jesus, but listen to how it states when you add your own name in there. For God so loved Scott that he gave his only begotten son, that if Scott believes in him, he shall have everlasting life. Friend, if you don't know Jesus today, will you put your name in that verse? Whatever your name is, put your name in that verse. And if you'll do that and believe in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. How, how, do, how do I put my faith and trust? You need to pray to God, cry out to him and ask for the forgiveness and salvation you desperately want and he'll bring it. Let me lead you in a prayer, but I want you to pray it from your heart to God's heart and he'll answer that prayer right now. Here's how you can pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong. I know that I'm not good enough to go to heaven, but you sent your son to live the life I never could. And so by faith, I believe that all my sin was placed on Jesus and that he placed on me his righteousness. And now I'm one of your children. Thank you, dear Jesus, for forgiving me of my sin. Thank you for cleansing me of all my unrighteousness. And Lord, thank you today that you have saved me. I will from this day until I see you face to face live for you. Thank you for saving me on Easter Sunday. Thank you, dear Jesus. In God's name, amen. My friend, if you have done that today, let me just say thank you and congratulations. You are a child of God. You're in the kingdom of God. And I can promise you this on the authority of God's word, no matter what happens in your life, no matter where you go, Jesus will always be with you. If you've done that and you have prayed to receive Christ, will you go to our church website at dbo.church? And there you can fill out a virtual connect card. 
and you can let us know that you have prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We would love to know that because we want to know your name. God already knows your name. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but we want to know your name and we want to connect with you so that as your new connection with Christ is now beginning to blossom, we want to help you in your walk. So please let us know and fill out that virtual connect card. But church family, he's risen, he's risen indeed. Even though, as I said before, the days are dark, our future is bright because King Jesus is our future and he is risen from the grave and he lives for us each and every day. May God bless you the rest of this week. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of Christ I stand in Christ alone who took on flesh fullness of God the ones he came to save this on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live on me.